Okay, hello Neris. Hi Emily. Hi, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. How are you? Okay, okay, the sun is shining. That's nice. So, yeah, I think this is the first video I've done without a jumper on, so that's a nice change. Um, so Neris, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. I'm Neris Hughes and uh, I trained originally as an occupational therapist specialising in paediatrics, neurological disorders and sensory impairment and then um, I sort of started to explore trauma and whole body work, somatic trauma as well as psychological trauma and ended up opening a social enterprise called Whole Child Therapy for which I'm the clinical director and CEO and Whole Child Therapy tried to provide meaningful therapy to children as and when they need it and how they need it, um, regardless of their financial position or even their position geographically in the in the country and now we've experienced in the world. So um, it kind of, it grew on me very quickly. <laughs> it grew around me very quickly. Um, and now we provide sort of psychotherapy, art therapy, play therapy, body work practice through osteopathy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and uh, we work with lots of different charities, schools, and um, families. Amazing. I can see why it's called whole child therapy. <laughs> it makes a mm. lot of sense. Um, yeah. And of course, we're, we're facing a sort of unprecedented time at the moment that must be bringing up certain concerns for, for parents at the moment, um, especially, I guess, young children. Um, and do you have any advice first for the first for the parents on how to reassure their children about what's happening at the moment during lockdown? Yeah, I think one of the things to remember is that children's children's drive, like our innate need, is really different to adults' innate need. So adults have learned to use a really lovely big part of the brain called the frontal lobe. Uh, reasoning our planning skills and we utilize a lot of previous experience to plan for forward thinking so lots of feedback to initiate feed forward thinking and we learn don't we and you can feel that you're yourself through your own growth when you're 16 and 15 you make decisions really based on what does everybody think of me what do i need right now and as you become an adult 26 27 28 30 we start to emerge into thinking of what's the consequence of my action the other thing that's happening in little brains is that they're full of mirror neurons, full of new unassigned uh, axons and impulses that are trying to find information, trying to find new data. Whereas what we're doing in the adult brain is trying to sort out what we know into categories of I know this and I understand it or I don't know it and don't understand it, what do I do about that? Whereas children's brains are constantly seeking the new, the novel, the interesting, the innovative because their synapses are trying to learn more information. So what's happening for us is we're tuning into the news every day to find out what the facts are so we can put these facts into action and we can have a structure to our day and we can use our previous experience to plan for what's going to come next. Whereas for children, what they're looking at is what's in my immediate, what's my now, where, what do I, I want a cake, I want my friend, I want to play Monopoly and I'm not really going to think through the consequences of that and I'm not really thinking ahead to what next in the same way my mummy or my daddy will be. Mm. So a lot of what we're trying, we're being asked is how do I explain the coronavirus to my child? Well the coronavirus is really like that first time your kiddo says to you where do babies come from? And you think, oh, okay, I'm going to have to talk about everything. And your kid wanted a two-minute answer of, like, from my tummy. Oh, no, thanks, bye-bye. <laughs> and this is really yeah. similar. What they want from the coronavirus is, well, why aren't we allowed to school? Well, because we don't want people to get poorly. Yeah. And so we're staying home and to make sure that everybody stays well. Well, I'm not poorly. Why do I have to stay home? Well, we don't want other people to get poorly. And if we all go out, more people are going to get poorly. And if we all stay in, less people are going to get poorly. Because really, your child is still thinking, I wonder if I'm going to get that chocolate biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what their innate drive is. And they want to learn. Their brain is, is wired to take in all this information. So, you know, if they're hearing you talking at work, I can assure you that somebody else is going to hear exactly what happened in that Skype meeting. Um, that's happening to me all the time. Or they're going to want to come on board and join in your Skype meeting. So my two children, first day of Skype meetings, sat there with my team, 
first Zoom meeting and my children painted on black eyes and came and stood over a team of safeguarding professionals to show them their black eyes. <laughs> so, um, that was fun. <laughs> really what they were interested in wasn't really what mummy was saying. They were interested in connecting with me and connecting with human beings on the other end of my computer. So I had to give them one of two options, why at the minute they couldn't connect or a way with which they could connect. And they really had choices. Does that help Emily? Yeah, that does help. Let me just pause you for a moment there because yeah. I want to go back to what you were originally saying about explaining it to them. And you mm. used the phrase poorly rather than virus disease. Um, why did you choose to say that word? Well, poorly is a word that for my children is a known word and poorly, it, it frames their ex the, the likely experience. So I'm not going to create new language for a new and novel feeling and experience. I'm going to try and keep as much familiar in that communication as possible. Great. Um, so, yeah, so using words that they already know no. and understand the meaning of. Yeah. yeah, we don't need to make our children terrified of the virus. We need our children to understand that something big is happening, but it's okay, the grown-ups have got it. Lovely. Okay. And, um, yeah, so you're in your Skype meeting, I, you know, we're, we're just experiencing this all over the place at the moment. The kids want to be involved still. Um, mm -hmm. What if you have a really important meeting and you would actually quite like them to stay in another room? <laughs> is, there, is there any way of negotiating that with them? Well, I asked my two because obviously anything clinical I do has to be confidential. Other children don't want to communicate with me if they think there are children in the room with me. Um, I mean, we've, we've done a lot to make sure that our non-parent clinicians are doing as many therapy sessions. But also I'm having to run supervision for my team who are managing some really complex situations at the minute. So there are times my children can't really hear what's happening. A couple of strategies like headphones and microphones are great, but also I asked my kids what they wanted me to do. And my seven year old said, why don't we use the stickers that you use at the clinic? So in our clinic rooms, we have room in use, room not in use. Mm. You're allowed in, you're not allowed in sort of the welcome, not welcome signs to protect those environments for the visitors. Mm. And she felt that that was a really good opportunity, you know, really good thing for us to use. So we had a sort of a disturbed, do not disturb system. And they knew that mummy was available during these times. And then every day we set our schedule. So I sit with them and I say, mummy's got this meeting and this meeting and this meeting that are private time. Um, what are you going to do during that time to keep you busy? Now that sounds really efficient, but obviously it doesn't always work. And somebody's brother will always hits somebody with a tennis racket right in the middle of a meeting that that can't happen. But I'm also making sure that I start every call with, please remember I'm a mummy and I might have to go and do some mummy stuff. And I think maybe this is one of those times where we're all starting to realise that we are parents first and a bit of grace needs to come from both sides of that accent but yeah so my daughter framed it with let's set a schedule in the morning and identify those critical times let's use a disturb and do not disturb sign so even if you've got an old one left over from a holiday you could use or your children could make one and again if they make it they're going to feel more involved in it so they're more likely to follow that instruction mm. And as always, kind of having a conversation with them rather than telling them this is how yeah. it's going to be. Yeah, I ask my children, like sometimes mummy's going to have to have really private meetings for other people. What, what can we do to help them? And by framing it that way, my children felt that they were participating rather than being told what to do. And honestly, kids are the same as the rest of us. None of us really like to be told what to do. Yeah, lovely. And um, yeah, and you said that, remember that you are a, a mummy first, a parent first. I think it's quite daunting, this idea that we're taking on this other role of being a teacher and doing the home homeschooling at the moment. And I think um, a lot of people are struggling with that um, extra role they're having to take on on top of everything else. Um, do you have any advice for that situation? Well, I mean, the phrase, I'm good enough, I'm okay, let's start again tomorrow. <laughs> they all sound really trite, but, but you know yourself, they are actually really meaningful. They're just really hard to find inside yourself when you're feeling like this. I think providing and structuring your day and putting realistic expectations on yourself is really important. But also a lot of us are really scared what's going to happen to our job, if I'm not the one that's productive. 
am I going to be here at the end of this? And if I don't get my business working well, am I going to have the money to return? So there's a lot of pressures on us that just mean that all of those phrases fall out of the window in the actual living of your day. So I think, again, setting the schedule every morning. There's a lovely phrase that somebody said to me the other day, which is sometimes I just find out how the day is treated me before I decide tomorrow. And I think that's a really nice one. So if you've had a really long day at work on the Monday, see whether you can flex some of that working on the Tuesday and give your children some time. And then some maybe some anchor points throughout the week, what I like to call the regular occurrences. So, you know, we always have a tea party on one specific day. Um, we have cake baking on another specific day. Just little jobs. They're not long, they're just little things that I can benchmark the week with. Um, as silly as naming it like Manic Monday for Mummy, and, um, you know, uh, Tea Tuesday, Tea Party Tuesday, and um, Wild Wednesday because they get more screen time, and so on and so forth. And having some of those themes really helps children frame what the expectations on their are today, but it also helps you frame the expectations on you. And that's the balancing act, isn't it, Emily? Is, is, how do I balance the expectations on me when they are so tough with the expectations on me as a parent that are so tough? And the other thing to remember is that it's only really two hours for primary school children. We only need to be producing two hours across a whole day of educational input. Mm. So again, put realistic expectations on yourself. They don't need an eight hour schedule. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, other things can be educational, as I'm sure you know, you know. Mm -hmm. sandwich. <laughs> we're, we're really big advocates for that and last night my children and I made a cake ready for a, a tea party today tea party Tuesday and um, we and it, it's a birthday cake for one of the teddies so it's become a very big celebration um <laughs> you know we made that cake with the pound cake method so we measured the eggs and then we had to re-measure and we had to check there were grams not ounces and and so in itself, that was some beautiful functional maths um, and then fine motor activity and so on and so forth. And I think, remember, we're growing human beings. So them having some foundation life skills is no bad thing. Wonderful. And what about um, if I just want... I, I, I guess, is it important to also have alone time aside from work time and play time and maybe time with your partner if you have one around? Um, yeah, I think it can feel particularly selfish at the moment to then say, actually, on top of this, I need, you know, I need 15 minutes to myself where I go and meditate or do a bit of gardening or whatever. And well, then... In family therapy, we always talk about the oxygen mask on first. And we use the analogy of the aeroplane because we all know in an aeroplane, if you try and put the oxygen mask on the baby first, you'll collapse, the oxygen mask will fall off and both of you will end up having no oxygen. Whereas if you do what the air hostess says and you put the oxygen mask on you, then you're able to then enable your children to stay safe alongside you. And that metaphor works really, really well for our mental health as well. If we haven't placed the oxygen mask on us, we are not the right tool to raise our children. And I know this myself. I have, I have done the screaming at my children. I have done the feeling really anxious and knowing that they're seeing it. There's very little we can do to contain that every day at the minute. But we can think, actually, if I get my 15 minutes now, I'm going to do so much better at the job of being a mummy or being a daddy. Mm -hmm. So it isn't selfish at all. It's taking the five minutes to place the oxygen mask on you. So you are the right tool to raise your children. Brilliant. Okay. Um, any other tips, Naris, that you have? Oh, <laughs> so, um, this is the big one I'm saying to all of my families, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> as a mummy, every day I'm getting something wrong. Um, and I think making sure that there's a support system for that. I mean, one of the things that I did this week, last week, was I actually wrote a letter to my future children. Because there is so much, you know, as you say, I use very specifically the word poorly, not virus. The stuff that's happening right now that my 11-year-old understands differently from my 7-year-old. And there's stuff that's happening that I understand acutely differently to them. So, you know, mummy's an mummy, mummy runs a company. If mummy doesn't keep her company there... 
a lot stops for our family. I, my children don't need to carry that for me. I mean, I have said I need to work because I own my own business, but you know, so does the family that have delivery drivers, so does the binman. We all have to do something at the minute. So I wrote a letter to my future children that I will probably end up making a bit of a treasure box of all the things that we've made and done together at this time. And it just kind of justified my position. And writing it helped me, whether I ever give it to them or not, it just helped me remember that, yeah, okay, I, I shouted at 11 o'clock, but at 12 o'clock I made you dinosaur-shaped sandwiches. <laughs> and at one o'clock my meeting overran and I didn't get back to you till three o'clock. But then I played Monopoly with you. And that sort of seesawing day, writing it down reminded me of what I was doing and gave me a little bit of forgiveness for what I wasn't. And um, I think in your article as well, in, in, in I saw in your article talking, you had mums that were acting as a bit of a support group for each other. Yeah. I think utilising your resources of somebody to scream at, shout at, cry at, maybe have a glass of wine with on Zoom so you feel like you're not drinking alone. <laughs> None of those are necessarily bad things. So where there is some support structure, use it. Yeah, they were sharing um, one one failure and three successes or three failures of one success I forget which way around it was but just kind of knowing that you're all you're all struggling <laughs> I think um, it's helpful and no one's perfect no and my children do thorns and roses which is really similar so you do your thorn and your rose which is you know something that's been a bit tough today um, and something that's been a bit beautiful and the reason we call it thorns and roses is it just reminds you that you kind of have to have the thorns to get the rose <laughs> um, and that it's okay that every day we're going to have a bit of something and my kids are so different my daughter has to give me five thorns and will say a whole day for the rose and my son is like I have no thorns it's all roses <laughs> <laughs> and just their different natures shine through in that thorns and roses but that's it's really similar um and doing that with my children doing that with your partner doing that with your friends writing it in an email to yourself because you don't think anybody's ready to listen or you're ready to share it are all really valid options yeah i think your overriding message naris is just one of real kind of kindness and self-compassion in all yeah. of this and no one's going to get it exactly perfect because no one's no. experienced this before no and again it's really easy for me to sit and give this advice but it, it doesn't mean that i'm able to action that every day and i think that's a massive take home is yeah on instagram i've got a couple of really good pictures of dens and um and it's the, the same you know with my friends and their facebook accounts i'm like oh my god you built a whole new bird house i haven't done that <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's really important to remember that, you know, it, we have to work on being kind to ourselves over and over and over and over again. And, um, and every time you hear that voice of what you haven't done, just, you know, maybe, maybe remind yourself of the rose. It really can be as simple as, I had a shower today. <laughs> because these are such unusual times. I don't, I think none of us are meant to do this well. Um, human beings are meant to feel and get scared and be anxious and wobble and um, I think we have a bit of an expectation on ourselves sometimes that we're meant to know what to do and we're meant to have a solution and we're meant to get it right True. and remember who had a toolkit for this yeah. not one of us <laughs>